गुड इवनिंग सर सर आई एम रोजमेरी यस गुड इवनिंग डॉक्टर रोजमेरी यस होप यू फाइन absolutely absolutely fine but i am still not able to see how to share the screen uh i think i don't have a permission yet if i can test if uh, for sharing my screen we will start you want to do it right away so i will ask the present uh, presentation presenter to put off that and then only you can do it so i'll just yes. ask her uh, let me test it first yes yes i'll uh ruth Can you put uh, put off the presentation, Ma? Put off the presentation. Yes, Ma. Yes, Ma. Yes, Ma. Yeah. So we'll uh, want to upload this. So now, uh, I think uh, you will have to open your PowerPoint on the desktop, full mode. It done? Is it done? Cannot be full mode. I just, uh, just so when I the, click on the arrow, it asks me either entire screen or window. Should I ask you for entire screen? No, you can ask for window, window, window. Okay, ask for window. Okay, a window. Okay, yes, a window. It's saying you cannot share your screen. You must grant permission in order to share your screen. That's the message mm -hmm. coming. Okay, so uh, so it's good that we I tested before so that uh, we don't have problem later on. Okay, so uh, sir, can you do a uh, convert uh, PDF uh, PPT into PDF and send it to us across to us in that rose dot Mary? We can do the presentation from here while you speak. Uh, let me let me do that. Uh, you'll have to convert it to PDF and then send because otherwise it doesn't get uploaded. Easy. Open and save it as save as PDF. Yes, that's what I see. This PDF. Yes. And, uh, and uh, send it to Rose dot. We have sent her this much. So send the message right away. Rose dot. So I will I will send it to the. Well, this is called the Portal to See Technology Unit. To that one. No. Send a message right. R O S C Rose. Just a minute. R O S C. Dot. Dot. M A R Y. M A R Y. H K A U. H K A U. Dot in I N. Okay. R O S C dot M A R Y H K A U dot in. Yes, sir. Just a minute. Uh, yeah, I'm sending it. Okay. Done. Just just a minute. Just a minute. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, no issues. After you're done, I'll do it. Yes, it's gone. I send it. I'll just, I'll just check. Still, let me check if I can. Yes. I'll check from here. No, cannot share the screen. I dismiss it. Saying uh, no, cannot share my screen. I don't know why it's not permitting me to 
share my screen. Uh, and, and, and up arrow, uh, why don't you try the, your entire screen? If it is yeah. open, yeah. I, I tried that as well, but saying cannot share screen. You must Same. grant permission in order to share your screen. I don't know to whom should I grant permission. Yeah, but you have access share their screen when turned off only. Only host can share. Uh, one second. Uh, uh, I have done the share screen option. Okay. I have already, it is already on. Let me check. So can you try once more? No, sorry, it's giving the same. So did you see my presentation? No, not yet, not yet. Not yet? Not yet. I have. Is it uh, rose.mary at ku.in? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. yes, it has, it has gone. Yes, I, I'll uh, I'm just looking for it. Just not to come. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to the fourth invited talk on the online lecture series, seed, uh, seed, uh, lecture series, Seed Sustainability, Caring, Sharing and Conserving for a Food Secure Future, organized by the Department of Seed Science and Technology, College of Agriculture, Velanikara, as part of the Golden Jubilee celebrations of Kerala Agriculture University. 
At the outset, I would like to invite our most distinguished speaker of the day, Dr. Kuldeep Singh, Director, ICAR, National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources, New Delhi. Sir, a very warm welcome to you, and we are indeed honored to be uh, listening to your lecture today. Welcome, sir. I have immense pleasure in welcoming our Professor Research Coordination, Dr. V. G. Jalakshmi, Professor Head, Department of Seed Science and Technology, College of Agriculture, Bellaini, who has kindly consented to give the concluding remarks for today's talk. Dr. Rosemary Francis, Professor Head, Department of Seed Science and Technology, College of Agriculture, Bellaini, Kara, for organizing the series and for agreeing to deliver the vote of thanks. Last but not least, I welcome all the delegates to today's webinar and hope you will be enriched in knowledge as always. Thank you and a warm welcome to one and all once again. Thank you. Thank you, Diji. I wish to welcome our student Vaishnavi to do the honors of uh, introducing the speaker. Over to you, Vaishnavi. Thank you, ma'am. I kindly want to introduce the MDK of Dr. Kuldeep Singh, Director of ICAR in Bipriya, New Delhi. He has been at the head of the of prestigious institution as a ruler since 11 August 2016. Under his able guidance, the institute has become a need to be reckoned in the national and international arena. Dr. Singh pursued his B.C. agriculture from Swar University, Udaipur, and earned his M.Sc. Ph.D. in breeding from Agriculture University, Ludhiana. He played a gold medal for the during his in July 1990 as a student at PAU Ludhiana. During his change, proceed with development and three varieties established the protocol of hybrid <coughs> Between you know, the two, is a series of sex fighting, the enemy person classically leads the fight. Cutting the vision of Jay and Funny was centromere on the 12th year. He says, This is my second. Dr. Junior to win the PAU Luciana in various capacities as molecular genetics, senior molecular genetics, and director of the School of Agriculture. During his second inning, say we and write the incident. Hopper and Rice, Middle Dean, considering the resistance to strike, leave us fierce system immature, cardiac milieu age. Molecular reading in Rice and genome sequencing has been fortunate. Was created as an uphill after international sequence initiated the system in the approach. Dr. C took the challenge of leading the group in India to complete the assignment on Chrome 2A of B using next sequence approach. Is subject to describe the sequence. Make the body sees the police he has won. National and international journal is article has been published, the student team as mentor, and the project he has been assigned. Let me conclude by me. Dr. Kuldi Singh is a teacher, researcher, and administrator by excellence. I want you, sir, to interact with us. Thank you. Thank you, Vaishnavi. While uh, sir is getting ready uh, uh, for a better experience, I would uh, request everybody to kindly keep uh, the mics muted uh, while sir's presentation is on. And uh, you can now uh, put it on, uh, put off, or uh, turn off your webcam. 
uh, during the presentation also. And uh, of course, you can raise the hand, um, click the hand icon or send in the messages in the chat box if you have any queries. And uh, I also wish to say that this uh, proceeding is being recorded. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shari. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are very much audible. It's fine. Professor <coughs> V.G. J. Lakshmi, Research Coordinator, Dr. Rosemary, Professor and Head, Department of Sea Science and Technology, Dr. V.G. Benson, Professor, Department of Sea Technology, seeing my colleagues, Joseph and Lata also there, I could see their names here. I may not be able to see many other colleagues, the faculty, and in fact, my dear students. Good evening to all, and thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to be a part of the Golden Jubilee celebrations of Kerala Agriculture University. Artists, congratulations to all of you, and I'm sure these uh, 50 years, you had a very long journey and contributed significantly to the state's agriculture as well as the country's agriculture. I have no hesitation in saying that Kerala has contributed probably the largest number of the land races in our gene bank. Thank you very much <coughs> to all of you, to the farmers of the state, who have been conserving this diversity for a very long period of time, and we are benefiting it. In fact, not one, not two, dozens of the land races arise from Kerala <coughs> have in fact benefited the whole world, be it Pokali or any other land race, which has been very, very useful throughout uh, the world. This is a right time when we are celebrating, you're celebrating the Golden Jubilee of the University. The world is going, uh, undergoing a severe change. We see, or uh, we saw the COVID impact. And in fact, many of the things are now taking us back to the genetic resources. <clears throat> In the last, I would say, 50 to 100 odd years, there has been a significant monocropping across the world, and we are not left out of that one. I'll give you some data later on from something around several thousand species which we were using for food at one time and now we are down to something not more than a few dozen species which form a major part of our food and in fact two or three are a major part uh, leaving out all others. The impact was so significant this time that the UN has actually decided to have a food system summit that's going to happen in October this year. All the countries are coming together to see how we can broaden our food basket. A nut basket is straight, we can say the plate which we are using for food, which right now may be a one item or two item. If we say pizza, it's just single item, SH. Or you say the burger is a single item. And maybe rice and sambar, two things. So now we really need to look into that one. And in fact, it's based on that one. We'll see, we'll share with you how crop diversity is important for our future. May I have the next slide, please? Good. And in fact, though we are working with the plant biodiversity, but plant diversity alone is not sufficient. It's the agrobiodiversity which is more important for us. And here is a small definition 
of agrobiodiversity says it includes all sort of the forms of the life, be it animals, plants, anything that's used as a food, feed, fodder, fiber, and we should not have any doubt now to say that conservation of agrobiodiversity will ensure food and nutritional security and the good health. In fact, we have never been talking of the word good health. And you will see in my presentation, the word health is going along with the nutrition and the food. Next slide, please. Now, these are some of the facts. My first 10 and 15 slides will really provide you the glimpses of the challenges we are facing right now in the world. And these are some of the hard facts. In fact, nature had provided us with a large diversity in crops, and that was enough to fulfill our requirements, be it for food or fiber or fuel or medicine or even aesthetics. And there was a good synergy coexisting prior to what we call an industrial revolution. And the fact right now is that anthropogenic developmental activities, they have caused a huge loss to diversity, to the adaptive and evolutionary processes equally. These are some of the important facts with us. Next slide, please. Next, please. Yes. Okay. Uh, now have a look when I'm saying the, how the things are changing. I'm, I've taken a small example from the hill agriculture. The same is true everywhere in the country. If we see 40 or 50 years back, and a farmer would grow 20, 25 crops on his farm. And that was sufficient for giving him the calories, the proteins, and the nutritional values. The same area, this is an example from one of the regions of Uttarakhand. The same region where 25, 30 crops were being grown, you have just one crop, P, P, P. Three seasons a year. And it's because of the commercialization. Now, the farmers may be getting a better remuneration out of this, but not the better nutrition what his or our family requires. Now, this sort of change has happened throughout the world, throughout the country, and it has the ramifications as well, which I will share with you a little bit, little bit, a little bit later. May I have next slide, please? <clears throat> next, yeah. Now, we really need to see that uh, if we really have to measure this biodiversity, what we call agrobiodiversity, we need to have an index. And this index, in fact, is in the preparation at the moment. There are not many indices to see how what we call as a diet, which is a region which has a complete agrobiodiversity. And this index, it has three pillars, basically. If we see at the top, that's the ultimate. You need the diversity or agrobiodiversity in the markets and in the consumption. And if you have a biodiversity in the markets, biodiversity in the consumption, you will have the healthy foods, a healthy diet. And this biodiversity in the food, in the markets, will depend upon the agrobiodiversity in the production. If we are growing only one crop throughout a state, our markets, our supermarkets will be filled with that one. If we are growing two fruits only, the supermarkets will be filled for two fruits. If you're growing two vegetables, the supermarkets will be flooded with the two vegetables. But if you have a diversity of, let's say, 20 fruits or 20 vegetables or 10 cereals, your markets and supermarkets will have that sort of diversity. 
and diversity in the production system in fact that will depend a lot on diversity in the genetic resources so there are basically the three pillars if we really want to have a good diet a diverse diet we need to have a diverse production and for diverse production you need a variability in the genetic resources as well now the next slide please Uh, this is just to tell you a simple example of how 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 you have the different indicators of the diversity if you see the top panel you have a diversity of the within between the crops so we need a diversity between the crops but within a crop as well we need the diversity for sustainability so it's not diversity alone at the crop level diversity within a crop is equally important and that's where the plant breeders have a made that if they have the diverse set of varieties it will go into the farmers field as a diverse ones and overall the universities and the policies have to be in such that we have the diverse crops on our fields next please uh we we don't have a doubt in saying that commercialization is the biggest threat to diversity as 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 more and more we are going towards commercialization we are starting we are growing only a few crops that's true so there are several factors several forces which actually push the biodiversity away however there are certain policies instrumentations at the global level which are actually helping us in improving the biodiversity be it the sustainable development goals of the un be it the it targets be it the national biodiversity targets or be it the delhi declaration because in 1916 the first international agro biodiversity congress was held here in delhi for which nbpgr was a major partner and the declaration that came out of that was the delhi declaration and that gives us some of the indications how can we really keep our diversity more and more on the farms as well next please uh although we call of we talk about agro biodiversity but my today's talk will be exclusively on plant biodiversity i'm not be talking about the insect biodiversity and animal biodiversity or uh, microbial biodiversity all those we have the different specialized bureaus for that one they are working on this one i'll be talking only on plant genetic resources because we said three pillars and ultimately the one with which we are dealing is the diversity genetic resources so i'll be talking more on diversity the genetic resources to see how we can use these for having the diversity at the farms and that will lead to diversity in our markets and this example is for students only specifically a simple definition of plant genetic resources we say any material of plant origin which is of actual use or of a potential use it may be in the form of seed the vegetative propagule tissue cell dna anything and that's what we define as agro biodiversity plant genetic resources and when we say plant genetic resources conservation of plant genetic resources we are conserving all these types be it cell or pollen or dna molecule we are conserving all of them and that's how we are actually working uh, we have a working definitions of the plant genetic resources and we work along with that one next please uh there are 17 sustainable development goals and we have identified ourselves with seven sustainable developmental goals directly because if it's a goal number 1 no poverty or zero hunger or good health these cannot be achieved until unless you have a strong agriculture and strong agriculture cannot happen until you have good genetic resources available with you so all the six and seven we have mentioned here 
we are working directly and indirectly for these ones. And we have a responsibility of actually providing a quantitative data for all these with us. That's NBPGR's responsibility. And that's how we have seen how we are working with these sustainable developmental goals. Next slide, please. Having said that, we know we have a challenge. This is a global population, but let me go to the next slide, which is more concerning to us. Next, please. Yeah. See, this is this is important for us. That's it's that's the right now at the moment. I think in 20, 2024 we'll be equaling China. And by 2030 we'll be surpassing China. And by 2050, our demographic shares that we may stabilize as 1.66 billion people. Question will arise when we stabilize at 1.66 billion, will Mother Earth be able to sustain us? 1.66 billion? Can it provide us the good food, the requisite food, feed, clothes, environment, all other things? We have a strong belief in that, yes, it should be possible, and plant genetic resources will play a key role in it. Next, please. Can I have next slide? Yeah. See, another set of challenges we have. Last 21 years, out of those, I think, uh, 23 years, 21 were the warmest years since 1850, when the records have started, the records have been maintained. That's a challenge. So climate change is happening. The rate of extinction of the species is going at a very faster rate. And the data on vertebrate population, that we have lost 60% of the biomass of the vertebrates since 1970s, just 40 or 50 years or so as a challenge. The more challenges, 75% of land is degraded. These are the challenges with us. Next slide. This is a challenge with us. At one time, that when almost six to 7,000 species were used as food at a local level, and now, 60% of the calories we are drying from three crops. Otherwise, you can say 60% of the production comes from three crops, or the 90% from just 30 crops. This is a challenge with us. Next slide, please. And this is an actual data what has actually happened. Since Green Revolution in the 1960s, see the consumption of the millets, it has gone down by almost 60%. Sorghum, it has gone down by 50%. Sweet potatoes, coconut, yams, cassava, even the pulses, which is the main source of our protein, its consumption has gone down. It will have the ill effects on the society, on the health, on the climate, on the ecologies, on the sustainability. And these, these data I'm presenting to students to tell them that yes, they have a responsibility for the next 40, 50 years. And these are the challenges which we are just projecting, but they have to face these challenges tomorrow. Next, please. Can okay, I next slide? Yeah. Now, having said that, how this is impacting our population? This is a data of the National Family Health Survey 4 that was published in 2018. So it's a data between 2006 to 2016. And of course, 2021 data has been released, but it's a partial release, not a complete release because of the COVID. Now have a look on the, this in Punjab or Haryana. The farmers are not poor here. 
the productivity level is one of the highest in the world highly almost 100% area irrigated then what happened you see in the same 10 years time the proportion of anemic people has gone up by 15% how can we explain it and i believe it's simply because 80% of the area in punjab and haryana is under wheat and rice cultivation and another 10 15% of the few other crops which are commercial crops i mean 40 years back or 30 years back when a farmer was going to the farm it was a multitude of crops growing there he or she will have an opportunity to just take something out and eat there there was a fruit tree somewhere in one corner the other corner but that was sufficient to really meet our nutritional requirements but now your income might have gone up but this is the situation because you may earn money selling the crops but you may not spend them on buying the nutritional foods or buying a balanced diet these are the impacts which are happening in the country and you can see we're all like that next please this is another challenge have a look if you see here on the right hand side this is india other than cereals and the outer circle is what is your minimum requirement of for a good health good diet other than cereals we are deficit in everything be it fish be it eggs be it nuts be it vegetables be it fruits be it milk we are deficit in everything and that's probably we really need to realize that how our diet should be and diets will be determined by what we are growing on our farms and of course farmers will grow only those things which will give them better economics so we have a challenge and that is how we really need to look into how we these challenges can be met our diets and i want vegetables were very little fruits too little though we have a very high productivity of food fruits and the horticulture crops right now crossing 300 million tons but still that's not sufficient to meet our requirements so we really need to focus on those areas as well next slide please uh here again we have the same resolve that for doing all these things the genetic resources will be key can i go to the next slide please next slide yeah our resolve is that sustainable agriculture and diverse food intake they are equally important for a healthy population if we want the country to be healthy we really have to have the diverse food intakes and diverse food intake will happen only if we have a diverse agriculture and that has to be sustainable and for sustainability we really need diversity next please next please yeah so having said those challenges those are a bit uh, disturbing but at the same time mother nature has blessed india that we are very what we call a gene rich country uh you have you have dr joseph there he knows these things much better than anyone else knows in the country about different biodiversity hotspots uh, look at this one we have a huge diversity we are a center of origin of dozens of crops which are important crops for us we have a huge diversity for animals for fish for microbes everything we have so this is something which has been bestowed upon us by the mother nature next please and when we talk on genetic resources these are some of the examples 
where genetic resources from India have been used globally, and these have benefited the world agriculture. In our textbook teachings, we generally teach the importance of RHD dwarfing genes of wheat and dwarfing genes of rice. They're true, but they are not the only examples. These are some of the examples which are in textbooks, how the genetic resources from India, a single genes, they really have transformed the world agriculture. And the latest example is coming from this submergence one tolerance gene from the land race effort 13A. Its global impact is huge. If you see the impact of this one, FR13, it will be much higher than the BT gene in cotton has. And imagine how much money Monsanto has taken from our farmers. But India has been benevolent to the whole world. We have not charged a single penny from anywhere in the world for this gene. This is our farmers have conserved it. And country has conserved it. But we have contributed significantly to the world agriculture. We have benefited from the world agriculture as well. And that will come later on. Next, please. Next. Can I have a next slide? Um. Yeah, okay, good. And when we said we, are, we have been best, I mean, the mother nature has blessed us with a lot of diversity. And conserving this diversity is our responsibility as well. And there are several international treaties now in place to which India is signatory, be it CBD, be it Cartagena Protocol, be it International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, or Nagoya Protocol, we are signatories to it. And to ensure the protection of these international treaties, we have the national legislations as well. Be it geographical indications of goods, or the Biological Diversity Act, or protection of plant varieties and farmers' rights. All these national legislations are actually protecting our international instrumentations as well. And when we say we are signatories to it, India has played a very important role in shaping these treaties. And I will next, please. Now, these treaties have some value. This is CBD. I will not go into detail, but I will ask students specifically when any treaty is formulated, it has certain philosophies behind it. Can I go to the next slide, please? Now look, this I will ask every student. If you go to the CBD, read the preamble. Now see the preamble, it, it gives us a responsibility on us. It says, we are affirming that the conservation of biological diversity is a common concern of humankind. So all of us have a responsibility to conserve it. In fact, prior to CBD, the biodiversity was heritage of the humankind, but thereafter it has become the sovereign rights of the individual states. Along with the sovereign rights, we have a responsibility here. It says we are reaffirming also that the states are responsible for conserving their biological diversity and for using their biological resources in a sustainable manner. When it comes to state, that means the country, and country is what? We are the country. It becomes the responsibility of every individual. If we have the sovereign right on the genetic resources present in the country, we have a responsibility to conserve those as well. And in fact, all these philosophical things make us more responsible rather than having more rights onto this one. Can I go to the next one? To tell the students that when CBD came into effect, 
there were a large number of difficulties which people were facing, especially the plant breeders for exchange of genetic resources. And it was realized immediately that how to take care of those difficulties and then came into being International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. And we had 146 contracting parties which are signatories to this and India was among the first few to sign it and shape this one. Again, read the preamble of this one. It's giving us rights as well as responsibilities. So if we have something, some rights, we have to, we have the responsibility to really take care of it. And more important here, if we see here, that no country is self-sufficient in itself for genetic resources of all the crops. We are interdependent. And when we are interdependent, we have to, we are using other genetic resources. We have to be ready to give our genetic resources, share our genetic resources with others as well, which we have done wonderfully. India has done it so beautifully so far. So I will, I will ask students, do read these preambles of all these treaties. They will give you a sense of responsibility which you should have for the future, for the plant genetic resources, for the biodiversity in general. May I have the next slide, please? I will skip this one. Let me go to the next one. Yeah. Now this again to tell my students here that probably India has one of the best system or the most robust system for conserving its agrobiodiversity. And ICAR has five independent bureaus. Like we have the Plant Genetic Research Bureau here with which we are dealing with. We have the Fish Bureau. We have the insect bureau, we have the animal bureau, we have the micro bureaus, and all these bureaus are very rich and we are interconnected with each other. We know each other very well. We work with each other, help each other and benefit from each other. You won't find this type of system anywhere in the world, but we are actually conserving all these uh, genetic resources in, 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 in India. Next, please. Yeah, so coming. Straight with NDTGR, it's an independent institute with a mandate of the management of genetic resources. We have 10 regional stations across the country and one right hand uh, within uh, Kerala Agricultural University, for which we are grateful to the whole administration of uh, Kerala Agricultural University. We are a part of you. And my colleagues there, they have never faced any difficulty, any, any difficulty so far. And we expect it will continue for generations. They benefited from each other. And the PGI alone, one institute cannot work, cannot do everything. And as a result, we have 59 national active germplasm sites identified in the country. These are state agriculture universities. These are ICR institutions. And somewhere, DST, sorry, CSIR institutions as well, where genetic resources are conserved as per the agroecological conditions of that region. So we work in collaboration with everyone. Next slide, please. These are our major activities to acquire the germplasm, to characterize the germplasm, conserve it, and then share it with you. Four major activities uh, we have. And we are doing pretty well for all of them. I will go one by one to share some of the progress we have made with all these. Can I go to the next slide, please? Yeah, sorry, I think there was some disturbance in the um, uh, connection. Okay, <clears throat> so this is how NBPGR has evolved over the years. For every institute to progress, you have to grow with time. You have to change your mandate may remain the same. 
objectives may change with time, approaches may change with time, and as per the need, we have also evolved from 1976 when NBPJR became an independent institute to right now when we are talking, we are thinking of using high throughput genomics, high throughput phenotype, phenotyping, all those things in our programs. Next, please. This gives you glimpses of the genetic resources those have been collected, and we have a record that NBPJ started exploration from as early as 1946 onwards. And so far, since this was after 2021 year old data, we have collected 2.78 lakh accessions of germplasm from within the country. Overall, 15% of these are around wild crop wild relatives. However, with time, with changing time, our emphasis has also shifted. Can I have the next slide, please? See here, there's a complete change in this trend. If you see the previous slide, the largest number of genetic resources collected was from the cereals. But see one year, 2019-20, the maximum is vegetables, followed by pulses, or fruit crops. And if you see overall, almost 29 or 30 percent of these collections are the crop file relatives. Thanks to Joseph here, Pradeep here, the whole of the, the Trishu Center, they are really looking for collection of more and more wild species, which will one day form a part of our mainstream agriculture crops as well. Next, please. And just have a Simple availability, just to give you, it's not only the major crops we are collecting. Have a look here, this is this is a wild fruit, Karonda. Very important for in the northern parts of the country. Very rich in iron as well. This is another wild species from Uttarakhand. And all these things, what we're saying that we are not really now stressing only on the mainstream crops. We are looking for conserving the wild fruits, the wild crop wild relatives, and other species which may not be directly related to the food, but they may be related indirectly to aesthetics, to other things as well. So that's how the emphasis is changing. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this is uh, Joseph at one of the areas somewhere, Pradeep at some other places. And I can see Dr. Bans, uh, but somewhere else, they're looking for different areas just to give you glimpses of that. They really have to go to the difficult areas many times to, to ensure that we collect the germplasm genetic resources from us. Next, please. Yeah. So this is glimpses of this species which Joseph has uh, collected from Andaman and Nicobar. And see this one, this leaf. And you, you may see it right next to your own university with, the, with NBPGR, that this one leaf is sufficient to make one plate. And if this type of things have become available to us, we can rely more on biodegradable resources for our use, general use, instead of using plastic plates and others. This type of the genetic resources are important for us. Not only wheat and rice. Uh, after the collection, exchange of the genetic resources is equally important for us. We are the facilitators for exchange of germplasm, and on an average, around 150,000 samples are introduced into the country. These may be the germplasm, or these may be the breeding lines coming from the CG institutions. A large number of those are the lines which are coming from the CG institutions, almost 60-65% of that one. But good number of the genetic resources are from the, uh, the genetic resources. And if you look into the import, probably the private sector is importing larger number of the genetic resources now than the public sector is doing. That's a welcome step. In fact, that's very encouraging. We look forward from the private sector to really see how they can bring more and more genetic resources from other parts of the country. Next, please. 
Though we ensure that we give you the genetic resources as early as possible, the seed you are introducing. But this is a point which I would like to emphasize. For many places, or many students, many faculty, they ask us, okay, they have introduced the germplasm from outside and they would like to use it for PhD student work. The gentleman, many times we, there may be some genetic stocks which may have, we may have these quarantine diseases, quarantine insects, and we cannot release that one immediately until we grow them under contained conditions, either at your facilities or at the facilities of NBPGR, wherever, whatever is possible. And that's true for the private sector as well. So many times we won't be able to give you the genetic resources immediately. It may take us some time. And do be patient with that. If you are really introducing, don't plan your experiments immediately in the same year. Next, please. I'm looking at the time, I may go. And so when we have the genetic resources, we have to conserve them. And we have three different modes of conserving those seeds. And there are some which are controlled, which are which is conserved at minus 18 or minus 20 degrees Celsius. Some seeds which are recalcitrant, they cannot withstand desiccation. Those have to be conserved in liquid nitrogen, what we call as cryoconservation. Many species do not produce the seeds, so we really have to conserve them in vitro and tissue culture. Still, there may be a large number of species which still do not respond to tissue culture as well. We may have to conserve them in fields. And of course, another important, which will be more important for the future, is to really conserve our genetic diversity on farm and as well as in situ. These are the areas which have been ignored until now, but we really need to stress onto those areas. Next slide, please. Okay, I will just rush, rush to the slides. Next slide, please. Yeah, see, this is the right now the status of the gene bank in, at NBPGR. This is the National Gene Bank. We right now have more than 450,000 or 4.5 lakh seeds which are conserved in gene bank, all different types. Next, please. Yeah, this is some of the seeds which cannot be conserved in, as seeds we have to, because they do not withstand a desiccation. These have to be conserved in cryo. Next, please. Yeah, this is the vegetative. We can, we can skip these. We can rush some of these slides. Yeah, this is the genetic resources which we are conserving in C2, be it in tissue culture, almost more than around 2,000 species, 2,000 accessions we are conserving, sorry, 2,000 accessions we are conserving of different fruit crops. And likewise in cryo, almost 13,000 accessions we are, 14,000 accessions we are conserving in cryogene bank. Next, please. This is genetic resources which are being conserved in the gene bank. They're just the numbers, but the point is that it's not one approach. We really have to have a multitude of approaches to ensure that we are conserving, if not all, but most of the genetic resources we have in our country. This is some data on the field gene banks. This is field gene banks of NBPGR per se. Next, please. Next. Yeah. This, is, this is giving you the genetic resources division within vegetables. So, Anyone who wants to really reach our gene bank can have all this access to any, anything of you want, really. And this data is provided in a beautiful way, different forms. Next, please. Yeah, this is the data. There are some of the species which I told that uh, we have the national active germplasm sites. They are being maintained at different places. Cassava, sweet potato, yams, aroids are all in south. So are the yams and Chinese potato, and of course potatoes are CPRI Shimla. All these are with different centers which they are growing. They are they are managing with them. And PGR issues them the basic uh, uh, sport and the national identification numbers. Having said that, we are not only conserving; we are characterizing our genetic resources as well. A large number of those have been characterized in collaboration with most of the universities or the ICR institutions. And we have a complete list of the 
trade specific genetic resources well defined with npgr this is just glimpses of some of the important major crops i won't say important some of the major crops and the major diseases we have you have the number of the accessions which are available for that one this data is available to npgr next please individual accession numbers for each trade they are available next please some some of the very unique uh, genetic stocks those have been identified they are there for example this uh, uh, yellow colored or the orange colored uh, cucumbers which are high in carotenoids they may be rich in vitamin a as well but we are simply saying carotenoids right now and there is a good germplasm right now available at tissue as well which has this sort of germplasm and if you can have good carotenoids if they are vitamin a rich these could be eaten raw and that can really help us in overcoming our vitamin a deficiency we are actually conserving or registering a good number of genetic resources so i will definitely um, impress upon the research coordinator here that nbpgr is registering specialized trade specific genetic resources and the system is very well established all online contribution from ka you are not many so i would request you to really impress or stress your staff that whatever good genetic resources you have well trade specific those should be registered with nbpgr that will help us in conserving those as well and in fact nicer system uh, a publication and a genetic stock registered with nbpgr has the same value be it in the, their advanced career advancements or other things they have the same value next please so these are some of the important traits we saying we have the lines with high protein high amylos or low amylos when it comes to rice uh, all sorts of the traits we have now right now almost 1400 trait specific germplasm that is registered at nbpgr and anybody can access to those one and uh, get a copy if you want to use any one of them. those are available next please and this is how you will see the gene banks in future now wherever we have the information on the passport data of an individual accession its location be it longitude latitude or the village from where it was collected or even the tehsil where it was collected we are geo referencing all of those for example if you see this rice one here we had collected so far 44000 accessions indigenously and we have a good data of around 37000 and those 37000 spots are here and what we are doing now we are superimposing climatic maps onto this one those may soil map to may be altitude map those may be temperature maps so that if anyone is interested knowing to germplasm of rice which will be tolerant to salinity so if you have a soil map superimposed on this one you can better look into this region only and choose the accessions which have come from that region they may have a higher probability of having the salt tolerance or the salinity or alkalinity or salinity and that's how we are doing it so these maps are available at nbpgr we have released yesterday a, a small uh, um, we call an app as well that will help breeders uh, to choose the specific climate so to, to really predict and choose the germplasm for a specific uh, purposes as well next please and all this information which i have shared right until now it's available at our portal what we call as pgr portal if you visit and the pgr web page click on the pgr portal it will give you a complete information different ways of information you can access there from there next please think uh, we need to rush some of them you can rush these slides giving a glimpses of the variability to the students you can rush these slides yes the variability in barley variability in uh, uh, millets variability in chili this is variability of rice in tripura next this is variability of beans in tripura or in sikkim this is variability of the one of the wild species of the cucumber which has given many genes for resistance 
variability interface. This is just for the glimpses of the students to have a look on the variability. We can skip, we can just rush some of these slides. Variability in different wild fruits. This, this, this is primarily from the arid region. And some of the important uh, crop, wild crops, which are not in the main domestication. Uh, there are several crops which have the potential to become the mainstream crops. And NBPG is working on all of them as well. We are working on 16 crops. These are pseudo cereals like amaranthus, buckwheat. These are some of the legumes on which we are working. Next, these are some of the oil seed and vegetable crops on which we are working. See, I, I, can, can I go to the previous one, previous slide? I just tell you one few See this, 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 if you see this species, Kalingra, this is a species which is growing in the desert where nothing else can grow. And you know how this is being used? Seeds are important. And NVPGR and Kazri has released a couple of varieties which have the high seeds. And this is actually a substitute for cashew. You might be seeing in the market kaju burfi or cashew burfi or cashew, cashew curry in high-end uh, uh, restaurants or so. Just try to taste them and see if you taste cashew in those or no. This is a substitute for the cashew. And 50% of our requirement we are actually importing from other countries from Africa. But fortunately, the good thing is that the nutritional value of these seeds of Kalingra are better than that of the cashew. So these are some of the important crops, uh, which we, perilla, for example, is an oil seed crop. Concorda is a uh, vegetable, which is, uh, which is a very high value crop being used for, by the uh, patients who do not, these uh, sugar patients and who do not like the bitter uh, karelas for, for, for eating. So, good number of the crops are there with which we can work. Next, please. Okay. So, having said that we have collected sufficient diversity with us, the large number of gene banks in the world, almost 4.8 million accessions are being conserved globally. However, there is a general criticism that gene banks are not being used. And in fact, there's some data that say less than 5% of the conserved germplasm is being used in the breeding programs. It's partly true. So we really need to see the gene bank curators, the gene bank people have to think how their resources could be made better available, how they can be better used. And I will give you some few examples how NDPGR has actually changed its strategy. This is just one glimpse, though it's said it's not being used in breeding programs, but our record shows every year 15 to 20,000 accessions we are actually sending it to different partners within the country. This is our exchange within the country. And if I see in last five years, more than 65,000 accessions of different crops have been shared with our colleagues and within the country. Next slide, please. And some examples where I would like to appreciate Kerala Agriculture University that they have recognized the use of the germplasm from NDPGR. This is what we actually look for, that people use the genetic resources. Kerala Agriculture University has acknowledged it because they have not changed, they have kept the original IC number as well. That is what we are looking. There are many groups in the country who have not given the original IC number from which the selection has been made. You have released several varieties from that one and we are thankful to you for really acknowledging the original identity of these uh, lines in the gene bank. Next, so you have the yard head, a yard long bean, you have generated your release varieties. Next, please. Next, just we will just go through. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, lady finger okra, the varieties which you have released there. Next, please. Uh, greater yams, uh, Chinese potato, and uh, some of these. If we see the Telangana Agriculture University, they also have released several varieties directly from the germplasm. So we have examples where even today 
if we see the total number of the varieties, those are released in vegetable crops specifically, 80% of them are selections from the genetic resources, or even more. The 20% of species are the varieties which have come from the hybridization programs. So leaving a few crops, which are a major crops like wheat and rice, where you had a global sport and other things, or maize. For all other crops, the primary method of still is the selection from the genetic resources. And that's how the genetic resources are important for us. So whether you have the first phase of breeding, second phase of breeding, third phase of breeding, everywhere the genetic resources will be important. And of course, the latest technologies of genomics are helping us in characterizing our genetic resources much better. From RFLPs in 1980s to straight away sequencing in 2010s or right now in 2020, the things have changed a lot. And with those developments, we have also changed. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, I will go next slide, please. See, this is a small example, some data from our own group here. It's a 300, and, <clears throat> 300 lines of the land races, which were characterized based on just 30 SSR markers. And same set of lines analyzed using 50K SNP chip. You can see a huge variable variation between the two systems. So it's showing us that the modern marker systems, which are relatively cheaper, less time consuming, they are providing you a better structure of the genetic resources. But more important learning is here. These are these three hundred lines from different parts of the country, from different space, states. And it was very clear that these genetic resources are absolutely independent of each other. And that's how we are now looking. Our, there's a completely paradigm shift in the gene banks now. We are now trying to really genotype all our genetic resources using high throughput genomics so that we know the structure of the populations. And breeders can make a choice for their breeding, for their, for their breeding programs how they can choose from the gene banks the most diverse germplasm which they can use for different traits. Can I have the next slide, please? And this is our basic. So this is, this is an overall a scheme which is a bit more complicated for undergraduate or students or so. But the question here is, we are actually bringing high throughput genomics, high throughput phenotyping, all sort of disciplines together so that we are characterizing, evaluating our genetic resources for every important trait and identifying the DNA markers, those will be linked to those ones so that we give a complete package to the breeders to work with it. We right now have this type of project for 16 different crops like we have the minor pulses, minor oil seeds, and of course, few major crops like wheat, rice, chickpea, and many more. And some of them are still in the preparation fire, like minor millets or cooker baits, which are a very important group of crops. We have not characterized them to the level we should do, or we have not characterized them to the level where we have other crops like wheat, rice, and other things. So this sort of strategy, we have been supported by the DVT, we got a funding of around 280 crores for this one, and we have more than three to four dozen centers within the country who are working in a network mode for all these crops. So we expect the next five years to give you a what of trade you're looking for, for genes you are looking for, the traits you are looking for, and in fact, specific uh, genetic resources to you. Next, please. Just next, go next. Next, please, next. We can go to next, because I'll take more time now. We can go to next, please. Yeah, see, this is just one example of uh, large scale characterization, giving you the glimpses of the photograph in the field. For example, there are 4,100 accessions of black gram, uh, green gram, sorry which are being grown at different places, all in one go. And we'll be genotyping all these 4,000 accessions. We have a phenotype with you, 
So we should be able to identify the traits and the markers linked to those traits from this germ plasma. Next, please. I'll give you a very interesting example. Next. Next. See, see the variability in this one. This is the mung bean, the green gram. And next, please. Yeah, no, next. We can go next. I will go more on other crop as well. See, yeah, next. I can go to the next slide. Next slide. I can go to the next slide. Yeah. Look, look, this is this is one important crop, sesame, which was a very important oil seed crop. You all know its oil is as expensive as desi ghee is there. We have many problems in this crop. Our productivity levels are not very high. And two major stresses which we have identified, one is file ID, and second is the water logging. If there's a water for more than 48 hours, the whole crop is lost. So we are looking for the variability in this whole germplasm. We, are, we have almost 7,000 accessions of this one. And we are characterizing for every trait. See the variability here you have in the length of the capsule. You have a variation in the number of the branches, if there's unicolum or multiple branches kept, which, which are compact or multiple branches but spreading. All sort of germplasm is available with us. Next, please. Yeah. Have a look on the other traits, the phenotypic variability. You may have from a single capsule per axle to multiple of those. Next, please. Next. We subjected a large number of these germplasm to the water logging. And based on our first year results, we have identified 40 accessions which survive well after 48 hours of flooding. And that's the trait what we are looking for in this one. Because in North India, if you have uh, torrential rains which are coming and if your water stagnates for one or two days, the whole crop is lost. We have identified 40 accessions the first year. We are revalidating those. File ID is another important disease. Planting this material at four hot spots in the country, we have identified around 20 accessions which are showing resistance across the locations. And 12 of them are showing resistance across all the four locations, including Vradajilam in South, Chavalpur in Central India, uh, Jodhpur in the arid range and Delhi in the northern India. So this sort of thing we are doing for all the crops. Now, all these, this is being done from 7,000 genetic resources. All these 7,000 children will be genotyped with high throughput genotyping to get a good analysis later on that if we have, for example, these 12 sources of resistance to file ID, are these 12 same gene? Are there different genes? Or what it is. That sort of information we will be getting soon from this set of material. Can I have the next? Yeah, I think these are our future plans. Uh, I will skip this one and finally I would like to thank uh, all, all my colleagues because uh, uh, this data which I have presented is the data of Hundreds of the people working at NBPGR, at agriculture, state agriculture universities, other ICR institutions, which I have presented here with you. I acknowledge the contributions of everyone in this data, which I have shared with you. Thank you very much. I think there was uh, it's a short time because uh, I didn't have control on the presentation and uh, I'm sorry for taking more time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The topic is open for discussion. Please post your queries in the chat box, or you may raise the ha raise your hands. We will call you one by one. Okay, Dr. Yasin Yasima, please. Hello, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Is sir, it Yasin? Sir, many times I get questions from students. They are yes. asking why NBPGR is not releasing varieties directly. <laughs> That's not within our mandate. For releasing the varieties, see, we have a mandate for potential crops. We have been given 16 crops to work with. 
and the ones which I have shown you for which NDPGR is coordinating. We have a network of 16 institutions who are coordinating onto this one. See, if we, if we start releasing varieties ourselves, that will become a conflict of interest. We would like to have everything with us, release everything ourselves, and we may not be open giving germplasm to the other centers. Since we do not have a mandate of releasing varieties, we are providing the genetic resources to everyone equally without any conflict of interest. I think that's a major philo basic philosophy for that. Yes, Dr. Rosemary Francis, please. Hello, hello, sir. Hello. I just wanted to, uh, yes, uh, it was a very interesting talk, so, but I, I would like to ask a question. Uh, so, uh, can you please comment on the present uh, uh, fad on going back to traditional farming practices, mm -hmm. reviving traditional food systems that you were emphasizing in the early phase? I find that these concepts are really contrasting with the very purpose of Green Revolution, uh, mm -hmm. almost reversing its gain. Can you, can you throw some highlight on uh, see, if I understood your question correctly, uh, is that are we going back to the traditional systems or that? Is yes. that right? Yes, okay. yes, yes. See, yes. Uh, I will not say that exactly that has to happen. My emphasis is on diversification. That what we are growing one or two or three crops commercially. Probably that's not sufficient. We must grow as many crops as we have around so that people have an opportunity to really uh, have access to those. Now, for example, we, we you take millets as an example. Uh, 40 years back, millets were in a part of our diet, important part, and we knew that they had a good nutritional value, especially for the micronutrients. All of a sudden, they went out of a diet because other crops were more remunerative, probably, and they had better scientific developments in those, and the productivity went higher. As a result, everyone shifted to the, towards those ones. Now, we are, I've shown you an example of Punjab and Haryana, where the population, which was generally considered very healthy population, is not that healthy today because of the monocrop. So what we are emphasizing here, a small farmer can really divide his or her land into smaller parts, one small part for himself or herself, where they can have diversity of the genetic resources, at least for their own consumption. And secondly, as the institutions, what we can think of not having a monopoly or monoculture of one or two crops. Really let there be a diversity in the crops. Of course, ultimately the economics will determine. But what we are trying right now to see, <clears throat> see for example, uh, we are trying to bring some of the traditional land races of uh, rice and other crops back into the, into the farmer fields. Now, if we see we can ask farmers to grow them for a year or two or three as long as our project is, but that will not serve our purpose. Our purpose will be served only if they keep on growing the diversity. And that can happen only if these traditional land races are related to the market. You might have seen these days a large number of the people selling the colored rice. It was, it's not it's not the commercial the commercial uh, uh, companies are not selling it but the ones who are selling the colored rice they you have specific markets you have specific market niches and people are buying it at a higher prices you take the crops like amaranthus it was earlier a very important crop of hills where every farmer will grow it along the bunts of, the, of their fields, but with time it has gone. But we, what we found, we could find a new niche for those crops, amaranthus, and a small area in Gujarat and in uh, Chhattisgarh, other states, they have started growing it commercially. 
and more and more are uh, this uh, amaranthus is becoming available in the supermarkets and there are people who are coming forward making different types of dishes out of that one so that's becoming popular you might have heard about quinoa you know quinoa was becoming popular more because farmers people are saying oh this is very expensive farmers may say they may get more market no that's not the truth they may not get if more people start growing quinoa the markets will crash and that happened twice in one year so until unless we look for a holistic approach having a crop diversification a variety diversification and market niches for everything we may not be successful in that one and if we succeed in doing this having more diversity with the niche markets available to the farmers we may have more diversity in our plates as well and i don't know how many of you have come from the village but the students who are from the village you may realize that a large part of our nutrition comes from the wild fruits which we generally are growing and you have full access to those commercial crops you don't have the access to those those are meant for the money always so these are some of the things probably which may change with time we become more and more uh, uh, health conscious and we realize that uh, it's the food in your plate that will give you a better health and uh, good health as well thank you sir uh, mr adarsh please sir good evening sir good evening I have doubt that the government have announced the MSP only for 23 commodities, sir. So it will also it will also affecting the diversity of uh, because farmer mm -hmm. will be reluctant to uh, grow more other 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 crops which are not in MSP, sir. So how what can be done, sir, in, in this case? What about, oh. what about, what about the uh, crops that is not there in MSP? What about the price of that crops? well i think uh, this is what i have been emphasizing that uh, we really need to develop the niche markets for each of the crop definitely farmer will not grow a crop that will not be remunerative to him or her and that's where we really need to look if for example if we are thinking that okay quinoa should be made a part of our diet or amaranth should be made a part of our diet we really have to start working on the development of all these crops they are at the moment low yielding hardly any disease resistance in those so that if diseases come farmers lose the crop completely so we really need to bring all those sort of things in these msp may not be possible for government to bring for all the crops we really have to make them more market competitive and that's how the young generation can think of uh, how how we really need to bring the marketing strategies uh, as a part of our agricultural education so that uh, uh we we think of when we are breeding when we are developing a crop or a crop variety or a technology how it goes to the uh, to the market where farmers can benefit msp may not be a solution for everything and i agree with you that uh, msp in few crops has really helped in monoculture rather than uh, has gone against the diversification but that was need of the day need of the country at the time when you didn't had much to eat we are feeling it that now we have sufficient uh, food grains available and uh, uh, farmers may not need support but farmers if we have taken them from let's say 20 30 crops on their farms to one or two crops we were responsible for that at the time and if we really want to take them back to this uh, multitude of crops we have to take the responsibility how to do that one farmers should not be considered responsible for that one we should be responsible for that and when we say we we is the scientists is the policy makers the government all of us and the markets and dr jay prakash please yes sir yes madam uh, sir good evening sir very good to you. see you sir so your presentation was excellent sir so i have one basic question sir just want to clarify 
So you are telling about the registration of so many varieties for uh, stress situations like submergence or for salinity or for any stress. So in that case, for example, uh, if you are depositing material one time, uh, having a score of uh, score three or score five, because all the jump lesson we are taking the relative scores and uh, scoring accordingly. Uh, what will you do, sir, to confirm it? Will you confirm it on screening or we will take it as such based on the results? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we, these, these guidelines are very well defined. Yes. We have defined for each state minimum four environments where you really have to evaluate it. Yes. These four environments could be four locations in a year, or two locations for two years, or maybe four years, one location. So trade-wise, we have very well defined, and we believe on your data, and we are asking for a public record. That could be your annual report, because we consider a institute's annual report is as authentic as any peer-reviewed journal. Okay, sir. But, right. I want to, but every time we say that in a set of genotypes, relatively we are telling. But when it is compared with the, any other superior genotype, then sometimes uh, that scoring may become inferior. In that case, I need some clarification, sir. No, see, it's, it's, we, are, we are quite liberal at this stage. Okay, okay. For example, if somebody sends 10 lines on salinity tolerance, yes, sir. we may register all the 10. With yeah. this philosophy that we are not yeah. sure whether these 10 have the same mechanism, yeah. same genes that confers tolerance, are there yeah. 10 different. So those things may happen later on as we have, for example, if we now have a, let's say we have 20 lines of rice or 30 lines of rice which are salinity tolerant. Then as a national effort, we can go to the detailed analysis of those. Okay. And and then also it sometimes becomes that if you have 10 different lines, they may have 10 different phenologies. One line may be useful at one place for crossing, second at second place. So we are quite liberal for that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Joseph, sir, please. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Joseph. Uh, sir, sir. Sir, it was a very interesting, elaborate presentation. Thank you very much. Actually, sir, KU is collaborating with us, especially Dr. Rosemary's department in regenerating and multiplying some of the gemblasm uh, because we have some wild, wild new problem here and she's giving us back on the deposit. So what I suggest regarding on-farm conservation, they have a good linkage with the farmers for PP, VFRA, award genome savior, award processing, then IPR, they have a separate IPR unit where the GA tagging, all those things they are doing and they have a good uh, linkage with the farmers where we don't have. So if something like uh, rehabilitating some of the lost land races from the gene bank and also the cutting from the farmers field if something remains and giving it to the NDPGR gene bank. If a model project can be, a pilot project, a small, small scale can be formulated along with the KAU, along with the NDPGR threshold. I think it can be a model. You may do some um, uh, some ideas on that, how we have a further uh, on-farm conservation taken forward. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, to, to, to just uh, share with you all a little bit more, uh, FAO had elaborate plan for really developing the strategies for on-farm conservation or in-situ conservation. And when we were discussing these uh, strategies two years back, most parts of the world said they don't have any experience actually onto this one, on farm conservation. Are, so nobody was really ready to go for the project-based working on that. Rather, it was suggested that we should have two symposia, one for in-situ conservation and then one for on-farm conservation. And uh, because of this COVID, it didn't happen like that, but there was a single virtual conference on on farm in situ conservation. 
And emphasis is definitely on how we can develop different models which are sustainable. I'm, I'm very open to the idea you have floated, Joseph. Let us sit together. Let's work with KAU. And if rice could be taken as one of the crops, I, I would say not only rice, let's take two crops. Maybe one could be rice, other could be any of the vegetable or any of the pulse crop, which we can take as a model for developing on-farm conservation. Uh, yes, it's possible we can do it. Then we have to look where from the funding can be. But initially, if we want uh, a smaller scale, then uh, I think MVPGS internal funding could be used for that one. But if we need a bigger one, then of course we have to look for the funding. But we can sit together and see where from we can look for the funding for this type of work. Any more to do? Any more queries? Anyone would like to interact with sir? Deji, can uh, if there's nobody uh, coming forward, uh, can we ask uh, invite Jay Lakshmi, ma'am? Yes, please. Yes. Yes, with immense pleasure, I invite Dr. V. G. Jay Lakshmi, Research Coordination uh, Group KAU and Head Department of Seed Science and Technology College of Agriculture KAU Alanikra to offer the concluding remark. She is an expert plant breeder, uh, especially concentrating on uh, stress resistance uh, breeding, uh, biotic stress, especially in rice. Over to you, Jalakshmi, ma'am. So, uh, Honorable uh, Director in BPJ, Dr. Kuldeep Singh, sir, we ha I have met you, sir, for my uh, DBT project. You were in the task force committee. I had met you about uh, 13 years back, I think, first time I met. 13 years back, <laughs> I still remember that. And I just very nice, uh, I uh, I was so happy to hear that you had been the director of NBPGR. Uh, you were doing very good hard work and good research at that time itself, sir. So, and uh, for at the outset, uh, let me appreciate the effort of Dr. Rosemary for arranging uh, uh, such a beautiful talk from the most eminent breeder of India. Dr. Kuldeep Singh, sir. So the past one uh, I and mean, 50 minutes uh, was actually very informative and very, very relishing. And the sir has beautifully explained how our food basket have been narrowed down by uh, limiting to the major cereal crops. Sir, you have mentioned very correctly, especially in the case of Kerala also, we, the uh, I mean, cultivation of pulses, oil seeds, and uh, many uh, rare crops which we were growing, especially sesame varieties, which were being grown as the summer rice fallows. Now the farmers have already uh, somewhat to an extent quit the cultivation of those crops. So it was really an eye-opener, sir. And you had very beautifully explained that uh, by giving the example of the hill agriculture where the, where the farmers had been forced to limit to a single crop while they were growing 20 to 25 crops previously. And also, sir has explained the biodiversity, the importance of agrobiodiversity, how the commercialization and industrial industrialization have harmed the extent of biodiversity. And then, sir... Uh, has told that the plant genetic resources have have a major role in the sustainable developmental goal of the UN. And he also mentioned the vision of NDPGR and also he, uh, sir, has uh, very beautifully projected the alarming situation where the entire world is going to, especially in the case of India, we'll be having about 1.66 billion to feed 
in 2050 and also the climate change which is degrading our lands that is 95 percentage of our land will be degraded by 2050 these uh, these uh, line of thoughts are each, actually a, a eye opener to the youngsters the future scientists who will be working on these crops so they'll have to keep all this in mind while designing their projects and sir has uh, very uh, elaborately mentioned how the diet gap has been produced that uh, the people restricting to just three crops that is the major cereals and avoiding the pulses and how the condition of india which is a biodiversity hotspot and the role of ndpgr in protecting the, the biodiversity of india and the yes, sir has very well explained the uh, three mandates of ndpg that is the collection conservation and exchange and also uh, uh, sir has mentioned that the future goal of ndpg is to have a give a trade specific gene specific resources so uh, your vision is very uh, very attractive sir so we hope that in the coming future we'll be able to get trade specific gene specific resources from ndpgr and the breeders all over india will be blessed to both along with NB, with the help of ndpgr and sir to add uh, sir has very correctly mentioned that kerala agriculture university is lacking in the registration of the varieties that will be definitely taken care of sir because we do have a lot of important varieties we are rich in many many characters especially in sesame and all we have good, good collection but i, I don't uh, we are a bit behind in registering them so definitely that will be taken up, uh, put into the notice of our director of research and necessary steps will be taken sir so thank you very much sir we had a very yeah, very 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 fruitful very uh, happy and a festive mood for the breeders to hear from you sir for the past few minutes thank you very much sir thank you thank you thank you jayalakshmi ma'am as formality warrants i take this opportunity to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of kerala agriculture university the department of seed science and technology and the audience i profusely thank the honorable chief guest of the day dr kuldeep singh sir special thanks to you sir for agreeing to share your time and knowledge with us your talk has been quite uh, motivating and very enlightening as uh, jayalakshmi ma'am said and i'm sure it has been an eye opener to many you have uh, very beautifully highlighted the need to connect between conserving the diversity the food system and the sustainability um, uh, the uh, the change it reminds us the extent of responsibility that we researchers need to shoulder to maintain this fragile uh, connect uh, we wish you all the best in your ventures future ventures thank you sir and i also th uh, thank uh, my colleague and friend uh, dr vijay jalakshmi for the brief and clear uh, concluding remarks thank you jalakshmi ma'am and uh, our most valued delegates and participants a big thanks to you all for joining us and staying up till the end thank you all thank uh, thanks to my team here who have toiled hard and stood together to make this happen uh, it's bye for now and we shall get together in the fourth week of this uh, month that is on the 28th of august uh, in the uh, by uh, for to interact with uh, shri em ahmed raza regional manager national seed corporation bangalore on the topic revolutionizing the indian seed industry 50 plus years of seed care at national seed corporation thank you one and all thank you Thank you sir. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Okay thank you Rose. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.